Well, good to be with you again tonight and open God's Word. We've got another meaty passage to uh, work our way through tonight. I would strongly encourage you to keep the sermon outline handy and uh, take some notes if at all possible, because I'm going to say so many things, it'll be impossible to remember them all. Uh, I'm going to make some introductory comments and then we're going to pray for us and then we'll get stuck into the text tonight. Uh, a variety of commentators will tell you that we now live in a culture that has championed the idea of expressive individualism. This is the idea that the individual is supreme above the collective groups of society. This expressive individualism is seen in the removal of most moral or ethical barriers and is replaced by the rights of the individual. We are no longer defined by truth, but by feelings. The rights of the individual are supreme. You'll commonly hear people say, be true to yourself, follow your heart. The social norms of the past are seen as oppressive and repressive, while the new expressive individualism is seen as the great liberator and throwing off the shackles of a regressive past. You cannot make a moral judgment about the individual anymore either. For example, if you want to have green, pink, blue, orange or yellow hair, that's fantastic. You might have seen some lately. If you want to shave half your head and tattoo your whole body, well, that's to be applauded as well, because that is you expressing the true you. You can wear whatever you like, have sex with whoever you like, because that is also a way to express who you truly are in utter freedom. Expressive individualism is seen in many other ways, but it is committed to self-expression, self-focus, and all in the search for self-fulfillment and self-actualization. And in a culture like ours, where that is common, there is a word which will generate heated debate at best and anger and rage at worst, and it is this word, submission. Submission is seen as the antithesis of self-expression. It is seen as self-abuse, as something you unwillingly do because you have no other choice. The Oxford Dictionary puts it this way, it is the action of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Well, with that cultural understanding, there's little wonder that people rise up in protest when the Apostle Paul says, as he does in Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Well, what an outrage. How dare he say that? People have long protested this saying of Paul. They're saying Paul must be a misogynist to say such a thing. He's advocating domestic violence or it must be just a cultural instruction so it's got no relevance to us. It's so outdated and some say he's giving husbands a license to abuse and so the protests go on. In the light of our cultural influences, those sorts of responses are understandable. But are they accurate? Is submission the arch enemy of the individual that it's portrayed to be? The great irony is that you cannot have a civilised society without submission on a great many levels. We all have to submit to a variety of authorities in the normal course of life. We submit to our governments, to our superiors at work, to our school teachers at school, to the road rules and much more. Expressive individualism taken to extremes will result in anarchy and that is the way our society is heading because no one wants to submit to any authority anymore, no matter who it is, let alone God. Which is why it is surprising to me that within the Christian church there is often loud protests against this teaching in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to say to us tonight that rightly understood, submission is the key to faithfulness, fulfilment and flourishing in life as God designed it to be. So let's pray and then we'll turn to God's word. Loving Father, we thank you for bringing us together tonight. We thank you that we have the freedom to meet. We thank you that we have your word so freely available to us as well. We pray by your spirit you would speak to our hearts and help us to have a right understanding of this word you've given to us tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us, we're up to Ephesians chapter 5 and the second part. And Paul, in this next section, refers to a mutual submission in three primary relationships. 
in the marriage relationship between parents and children and between masters and servants. And in the context of what we have heard from Ephesians so far, this idea of submission is at the heart of what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel. That's what Paul called us to back in chapter 4, verse 1. It's also what it means to walk in love, to walk in light, to walk in the way of wisdom and to be filled with the Spirit, which was all part of the first part of chapter 5. So this is just a further outworking of what that looks like. But if we are to see the beauty of Paul's instruction and not reject it out of hand, we need to have a biblical understanding of marriage and of submission in God's plans of salvation. So we need to do a little bit of homework. So let's first consider God's design for us in creation. The opening chapters of Genesis, I hope you're reasonably familiar with them. Chapter 1, we have a picture and insight into the creation of the whole world. And there we see that humanity uh, is the apex, the high point of God's creation. We're not like the other animals, as wonderful as they are, because we are created in the image of God. Created to live under his authority, to submit to him, but we are to rule over the world as his agents. And we're also created to enjoy a special relationship with God and with each other. In Genesis chapter 2, the general picture of creation seen in chapter 1 then becomes more focused as it narrows down to consider the development of the relationship between the man and the woman. These verses, I think, are foundational to a right understanding of men and women and therefore to marriage. In Genesis 2 verse 18 we read, The Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Four important things to note about marriage as God intended. I'll quickly go through these. First of all, is that God created us to enjoy relationship. He created us for companionship, not aloneness. At the most basic level, marriage is about companionship, not just cohabitation. The second thing to note is that men and women share an equality before God. Contrary to what some accuse the Bible of saying, men and women were created equal. One is not superior to the other. But there is equality with distinction. God said, I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the description of the woman as a helper is not to suggest that she is man's servant, but rather to emphasise complementarity. Men and women are functionally different in order to complement one another, not to compete with one another. At the end of the chapter, we have what seems like a summary statement when it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Well, there's two other features of what, how marriage is designed to be in these verses. The marriage relationship is envisaged as one of unity and fidelity, or if you like, faithfulness. Now, that term, one flesh speaks of passion and permanence, of total commitment to a person physically, emotionally, spiritually and mentally. In marriage there is a new priority in relationships. We forsake all other relationships in terms of importance for the priority of this one special person and unique relationship in marriage between a man and a woman. And the last feature we note is that God meant marriage to be a relationship of intimacy without fear. It says the man and the woman were both naked and they felt no shame. There is no greater experience of total intimacy given to men and women than in the act of sexual union where there is a coming together of body, mind and spirit. And such intimacy was designed to be shared without fear, without shame. God meant marriage to be the ideal for his people where men and women could experience a deep level of companionship, share in a relationship of equals with complementary yet distinct roles and functions where oneness and an exclusivity of intimate human relationship could be experienced without fear. It is a beautiful ideal. But, sadly, with the fall, 
and Adam and Eve's rebellion against God, where they chose not to submit to God's loving rule, God's original design for us in marriage relationship has been marred by sin. As a result, what we find is that marriage is hard. It's not always easy. It isn't always marked by close companionship. Instead of seeing our partners as a complement, they are often seen as competitors. Instead of oneness and unity, they often experience unfaithfulness and breakdown. These opening verses in Genesis highlight that it is humanity's commitment to independence and self-rule, or if you like, expressive individualism, that has led to all the pain and suffering in the world. And the first step back to order out of chaos and into the fulfilling and flourishing life that God wants for us is when someone submits to the rightful rule of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Paul has laboured this point throughout uh, the letter of Ephesians we've looked at so far and so I hope I don't have to prove that to you. Remember Paul told us once we were dead in our sins, without hope and without God in the world, objects of wrath, a terrible picture. But all that changes when we submit ourselves to Jesus' authority over our lives and his rightful rule and the loving gift of salvation he offers to all. One commentator said this, the essence of sin is arrogance, the essence of salvation is submission. There is no escaping the fact that according to the Bible, submission is not the enemy. In fact, it is the key to God's design for us and all relationships, first with him and then with each other. Husbands, parents and masters, as Paul highlights in these verses, have a delegated, God-given authority. But we need to understand that submission is not an abdication of self, so much as a humble recognition of the divine ordering of society and the act of submission to any human authority is actually submission to the Lord who gave them that authority. Well, mindful of this, now let's turn to the text and briefly consider the responsibility of the wife and then the husband. We pick it up in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is saviour. And as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. First thing to note is that submission is the norm for us all. We're all meant to submit, it's just expressed in different ways out of reverence for Christ. And note this appeal to wives for submission to their husbands is grounded in theological truth. It is grounded in creationism, not chauvinism. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now when you think about it, Jesus' headship is expressed in care rather than control, in responsibility rather than rule. It's not lordship so much as it's servanthood. And so wives are to submit to their husbands not because they're better than them or more intelligent than them, but because they recognise that God has given them particular responsibility as head of the relationship and he's going to hold them accountable. The wife is to support the husband in this role and encourage him to exercise godly leadership just as Christ does the church. I'm sure you'll agree that this instruction is challenging for both husbands and wives because since the fall, the natural tendency for most is to do the exact opposite. Ever since the fall, God's order and design has been turned upside down. Men and husbands, let me suggest, on the whole, instead of exercising godly leadership in their relationship, tend to either abdicate responsibility altogether, I don't want to do that, can't be bothered, not interested, or they abuse their position of power. The most common thing you'll hear amongst men is the mantra, happy wife, happy life. We've all heard that, haven't we? Very common. 
when it translates into this, as far as I'm concerned, just give her whatever she wants to keep her quiet and then we can get on and do what we really want to do in the end. Men, if that is the mantra of your marriage, I want to say, please repent. It's not even remotely biblical and far from being a loving husband to your wife. Wives, on the other hand, also do face a significant challenge because they tend to fear submission and either seek to control the relationship through manipulation or take over completely. And depending on your personality and your family upbringing, that's a pretty natural thing to do. That's what you've seen in life. That's how you've understood it. Psychologists refer to this dance in marriage relationships as over-functioning or under-functioning. Both of these approaches is contrary to God's design for intimate, fulfilling, loving marriage relationships. But that is what we most commonly see. That is what we're constantly battling against for each of us. Now one of the real challenges with all this is what God does is what is that sorry what does a wife who submits to her husband look like it's all good to say well that's a good principle what does it actually look like well because we're not given a list of the top 50 things or 50 ways that a wife should submit to her husband uh, all i know is that it will look different in every marriage if you're married you're gonna have to work it out to what it exactly looks like but it will always mean honoring and respecting your husband. Here's three question, questions for wives to consider. First one is this. Is the way you relate to your husband, the way you love and respect him, is it modelled on Jesus' love for the church? Does the way you relate to your husband make it difficult for him to exercise godly leadership? Do you affirm his headship, or do you constantly criticise and undermine it, seeking to take control? This instruction to wives may seem challenging and complex, but the call to husbands is no less daunting. Whilst it's often a great outcry at this call for wives to submit to their husbands, I've yet to hear anyone ever complain about the instruction given to husbands as to the way they meant to love their wives, even though it's a very high bar. Look at what it says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. At one level, the call to love our wives seems normal and natural. Of course we're meant to love our wives. That's the sermon's all about every wedding, isn't it? Make sure you love one another. It seems obvious. But it's the magnitude, it's the extent that we had expressed that love which perhaps makes these verses so overwhelming for husbands. We're not to love our wives when we can fit it in or when we feel like it or because there might be something in it for us. No, husbands are to love their wives in the same manner that Christ loved the church. And that sort of love is demonstrated in two ways. First of all, it's a sacrificial love. Christ's love for the church is the benchmark for a husband's love of his wife. Christ gave up everything, everything for his bride, the church. And we husbands must be prepared to give up everything for the sake and good of our wives. This will undoubtedly mean self-denial, it will mean loving without limits, it will mean putting the welfare and interests of our wives above ourselves. Now, I know it's a generalisation, but for most men, the sporting arena is synonymous with paradise. Whether it's playing golf, cricket, rugby, AFL, ping pong, badminton, you name it, any of those, that's a great joy for most men, whilst the entrance to a department store is an invitation to torment and torture. Isn't that right, men? Maybe. Maybe. See, but if we husbands truly love our wives, then we'll be prepared to forsake the heavenly greens for the fiery gates of the department store because we value our wives and we truly love them and are interested in them. Husbands, consider this. Are we attentive to the emotional needs of our wives, not just the material? 
Are we attentive to them as a person? Are we listening to them? Are we praying for them? Are we faithful to them above all others? See, if we love our wives as Christ loved the church, if we've got any hope of doing that, then we need to keep looking to Jesus, who is our great model of sacrificial love. But Jesus has also called us and demonstrates a sanctifying love. Paul tells us that Christ loved the church with a very clear purpose in mind. It says, to present her as pure, holy and pure, radiant, without wrinkle or blemish. Now the mention of being without wrinkle or blemish is sure to stir the heart of any woman. Don't you agree, ladies? None of us like any of those things. But Paul is saying that we husbands should be instrumental in the development of our wives' real beauty, their inner beauty, their maturity and spiritual growth in Christ. That should be our chief concern as husbands and it's a far cry from happy wife, happy life. Real beauty is seen in holiness and purity of conduct and the heart. Husbands, is this your chief concern for your wife? Are you encouraging her in the word of God so that before Christ she might be radiant and righteous? The question I think that most husbands must honestly ask ourselves is this. Are our wives becoming more like Christ because they are married to us or are they becoming more like Christ in spite of us? Worth reflecting on. Friends, submission is the key to a faithful, flourishing and fulfilling life as God designed it. It's a radical departure from the ways of the world, from expressive individualism, but it is at the heart of what it means to walk in love, in the light and in the wisdom of Christ. Well, before moving on, I want to make a couple of clarifying statements. We live at a time where the scourge of domestic violence is at alarming levels. It's a terrible evil and should not be tolerated. Some have suggested that this teaching on submission has empowered some men to make demands of their wives that leads to violence. And sadly, that may be true. But please note, the call to submit is an instruction given to the wife, not the husband. Husbands cannot and should not demand obedience or submission. To do so is a terrible misapplication of this teaching. Rightly understood, submission in marriage is a choice. It's a choice for the wife to be freely given without coercion or manipulation. Just as Jesus chose to submit to the Father, and as any Christian chooses to submit to our loving Saviour, Any form of submission in the Bible is to be willingly and freely given by choice. It cannot be demanded or imposed. And can I also say that if anyone is in danger through emotional or physical abuse, the scriptures would encourage them to make sure that they and those in their care are safe. Remove yourself from any threat. Marriages can be repaired lives lost cannot be regained. The challenge for those of us who are in Christian marriages is to follow the example of Jesus Christ, who though he was the head of the church, submitted himself to the Father's will in humility and self-sacrificing love. When we do that, we will show the world that love and submission go hand in hand as God intended. Well, it's a big topic and I'm sure we could have lots more conversation, but we must push on. But these principles that we've been talking about actually uh, apply in other relationships, which the Apostle Paul goes on to address. They are no less radical, and I'm just going to address those very briefly now. In each case, Paul is describing the way each person can, can conduct themselves in a way that is worthy of the gospel and brings honour to the people involved. In each case, there is a person with God-given power and authority over another and the other is to respond with grace and respect to that person's godly directives. Children are called upon to obey their parents while slaves are called upon to obey their masters. 
Now, it may seem strange to us that there's really no commentary here about the morality of slavery as a practice. But it would seem that uh, there were slaves who had been converted and in the church at Ephesus. And so Paul is concerned that they conduct themselves in a way that commends the gospel. He's not really addressing the rights or wrongs of slavery here. In our modern setting, it would seem appropriate to apply this teaching to our employment practices. It also recognises that the uh, obedience is here a command, whereas submit is a voluntary act. It's a very important distinction. Obedience here is a command, submission is a voluntary act. And we're told here children are to obey their fathers, and, and I'm assuming mothers as well, for their clear, the three clear reasons here, here they are, for its right, it is a command, it comes from the Ten Commandments, and so that it may go well with them, they may enjoy a long life. Don't we wish our children heard this a little bit more, maybe? When children honour their parents through obedience, it's for their good. Uh, they are actually honouring God and recognise that the parent acts as God's representative in their love and care of them. Sadly, expressive individualism is now poisoning our children and there is much to show that our, our children increasingly have little respect for any authority, let alone their parents. And that will always be a natural consequence when there is a declining belief in Almighty God who has ultimate authority over everyone and everything. But that's the trend in our society, isn't it? But fathers and mothers have an important role to play. As Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now there isn't time to explore all the ways that we parents can exasperate our children. Perhaps we can share stories over supper at the end of the service. But research indicates that there are at least two ways that will guarantee our frustration of our children. The first is inconsistency. Do we do what we say as parents? Do we live, do our lives back up what we teach our children? Or are, are our words just theory? If we say Jesus is the most important thing but church becomes an optional extra, we fit in when we can, what does that say? Our actions undermine our words. Then secondly, boundaries. Children need boundaries. Healthy, clear boundaries about what is acceptable and what is not. Boundaries about clear expectations. Instead of exasperating our children with inconsistencies, and non-existent boundaries, we are told that we are to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You've heard it said that it takes a village to raise a child. Christian parents are the primary disciples of their children. They're the primary ones who influence them in the Lord. But the local village church should be the primary village in their lives helping to support our kids in the ways of the Lord. However, if Sunday church, village kids and village youth becomes less of a priority in our families than, say, academic achievement or sporting success or birthday parties, well, then we should not be surprised if our kids don't become followers of the Lord and then struggle to respect and obey us, their parents. Well, as with children, slaves are called upon to obey their masters and so should a faithful employee honour the directives of their employer. And here are the characteristics of a faithful servant or employee. They are to be respectful and sincere, conscientious as serving the Lord, wholeheartedly, willingly and not reluctantly. The Christian person who serves under authority should be exemplary whether the boss is watching or not because they recognise that God is always watching. We work for the audience of one, for the Lord, who is above, sees everything. Our driving motivation should always be to please the Lord, knowing that all we do is an endeavour to honour him, even as we seek to honour our earthly masters. As it says in verse 7, serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not people because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. A couple of questions to ponder if you're an employee. 
Does your boss think it is a joy to have you on their team? Do they recognise that you serve passionately and humbly seeking the glory of the team and not just self? Well, masters and employers also have cause to reflect carefully about how they treat and care for those under their watch because they will be held accountable before the Lord, not just the shareholders. As it says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favouritism. In other words, whether you are master or servant, your chief concern shouldn't be earthly but heavenly. So whether you hold authority or whether you're under authority, you see your situation as an opportunity to offer the Lord Jesus as you represent him. Well, friends, much has been said, much more could be said. We must wrap it up. In a culture that champions expressive individualism, the call to submission is indeed challenging and countercultural. We've got to think do we want to be shaped by culture or by Jesus Christ? If we had to live lives worthy of the gospel, lives where we walk in the truth and in love and light and wisdom, then submission is unavoidable. Rightly understood, it is to be embraced as the key to fulfilling and flourishing relationships as God designed them to be. First with the Lord and then with each other. Rightly understood, submission is the great liberator, not a great oppressor, the great liberator that we all long for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for your word. It's a challenging word and a, uh, one that's hard to, to understand in many ways. But we see that you're from the beginning of time, you called us to submission. First of all, to submit to you and then to one another in a variety of ways. Please help us, Lord, to see this is your design for us. Give us your spirit that you might strengthen us. Help us to continue to live according to your word that we might indeed live lives worthy of the gospel and bring glory and honour to you in every way. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>